Artificial Intelligence, a Fan's Novel, Book One, Chapter Three, David. It had been twenty months since the presentation, almost two years since his idea, his vision, had ignited the fires of the great minds with which he had the honor to work, the greatest minds in their field. Now the time had come to put that work to the test. He had watched over every aspect of his vision's creation. There had been times when he could not sleep from anticipation of the next day's tests. But the director was a man of routines, of discipline. He had forced himself away from the lab at the close of every day. There had been moments when things did not go well. There were times when nerves became frayed and feelings were hurt. Still the project drew them on, past the point where emotions were ignited. They were engaged in a feat that had been deemed impossible by their contemporaries, deemed impossible by all precedent. And now, finally, they were here, deciding who would be the one to take this machine into their home and into their heart and prove once and for all that dreams and vision conquer all obstacles. The director was a man of dreams and vision. His heart swelled as he entered his office with the screening crew to sort through the applicants. The screening process was extremely difficult, his lead man said. It was almost tougher than building the prototype. This was not such an excessive exaggeration. With the prototype, they had at least had a working idea of what they were after. They'd had the components and the materials to bend to their design. But screening was another matter altogether. Out of over 2,000 Cybertronics employees, a surprising few had met the requirements for the in-house test that was the next crucial step towards introducing their secret new product to the market. The lead man leaned over the director's console and ordered... Initiate. The screen came to life. Query, prototype screening, internal data, the man said. The console obediently paged through the images of two dozen or so employees that had passed the rigid screening. We screened for employment record, quality of lifestyle, loyalty to the firm, and in this individual's case, the man gestured to one face among many. He pressed on the image, and the man's face grew to fill the screen. A family tragedy that may qualify him above the rest, the man said. The director eyed the image of Swinton Henry, New Jersey Division. He wasn't far. Better if something should go wrong. Son afflicted with Sinclair Syndrome. The boy was in stasis but the chances of recovery were common knowledge. The director studied the face on the screen. The pain hiding there was all too familiar. I'll see him, he said. The afternoon sun burnt dimly through the haze that had begun to envelop the Swinton's large exurban home. Inside, Monica stood impatiently in the living room by the inner portal of the front door. She had been preparing a new music layout for her next visit to Martin when Henry had called. He'd been excited about something. Don't leave, he had told her. Just don't leave the house until I get home, he'd begged before hanging up quickly. She had no problem with his request. She actually couldn't remember the last time she went anywhere, except to their small pond for a quiet boat ride. Still, at first, she had been disturbed by Henry's insistence. As time passed, she became annoyed. What was it that would cause him to act so? When was it that she had last heard him so excited? When Henry finally arrived, he paged in from the driveway and told her to wait by the front door. She didn't tell him that she'd been standing there for the last twenty minutes. She was very anxious. This feeling of expectation was too much like the moments by the phone so many years ago, 
as one or another procedure was tried to bring their son back to them. She fought to put the memory aside. Her husband was excited about something, and she wanted to share this with him, whatever it was. But the feeling would not go away. She was becoming irritated now. It was safer to not feel anything. The door hissed open suddenly, and Henry dashed in. His face was flush. He set his briefcase down by the door quickly and placed his hands on her shoulders. He looked so much like the man she remembered, bringing her little trinkets and gifts every time he saw her. What was up? Henry, she said, her face pinched in annoyance and concern. What game was this? Was it about Martin? Don't kill me, he said as he embraced her. What was he talking about? Henry, what are you doing? she demanded, but he just squeezed her tighter. I love you. Don't kill me, he whispered into her ear. He squeezed her once again and then stepped away. Doors close, he ordered, and Monica heard the outer door slip shut. Henry then waved his hand across the identipad and the inner door slid open. The boy had been instructed to wait till the front door had opened again and then walk into the foyer. The boy did not know foyer and had cocked his head to the side, his eyebrows pinched when the man asked if he understood. Then the man had explained that he was to follow into the enclosed area beyond the sliding doors after the man had gone inside. The boy understood now and remembered the term foyer for later reference. When the doors had opened again, the man was gone, but the boy followed instructions precisely and walked inside. Behind him, the mechanical door slid closed, and after a moment, the one in front of him opened. Someone was there. Monica squinted, trying to make out the features of the silhouette in the doorway. It was a short person. A child? Her heart jumped when, for one impossible moment, she thought that her little boy had come home. But then she watched in uncomprehending silence as a different boy stepped into their house. A blonde boy, dressed in a soft white jumpsuit that hung on him like robes. His entry was pronounced by the muted click of his protective plastic sandals against the Swinton's foyer carpet. His gait was quick and precise. He stepped forward and then stopped suddenly at the small steps that led into the living room. Monica stepped backwards involuntarily as the boy took one small step into the lower area and then stopped as if frightened by something. He tapped his foot against the wooden step and seemed to pay close attention as the sound reverberated throughout the room. He then stepped back and repeated this process on the carpeted area above the step. Whose child was this? Monica studied the boy's too smooth face. He looked blankly back at her. He seemed to be about Martin's age, maybe eleven, twelve or so. But the eyes were younger and somehow vacant. Was he challenged? Had Henry brought home someone's rejected child? The boy acknowledged Monica with a glance but his eyes turned quickly towards the sunlit area of the big windows that looked out on the pool. His head followed the path of his eyes, and then he turned and strode purposefully towards the windows. Monica noticed his measured steps, the halting way he scanned things as he passed. She knew those movements. The boy stopped at the window and then turned again to face Monica. He smiled at her, a peculiar, vacant smile, and in his unblinking eyes, Monica finally realized what had made her step back from this harmless-looking child. David's mind acknowledged the woman was looking at him, but she'd said nothing. He did smile. Still, she made no response. David knew faces. The woman's face was doing shock. There was apprehension there, too. He decided to calm her. I like your floor, he said.
I can't accept this, Monica yelled for the third time. Her tears were streaming uncontrollably now. All the anger and anguish that she thought she had left behind had returned suddenly, ravaging her. What in the hell had this man been thinking? That she would abandon her only son for... that thing? There is no substitute for your own child, Henry. No substitute! She scolded him, shaking an accusing finger in rage. You don't have to accept him, Monica. It's not too late to take him back. Henry countered. He'd left the prototype downstairs, alone, and followed her when she had fled in this sudden emotional outburst. Now he was trying to console her in their bedroom. He'd known that she would not initially like the Mecca, but this rage was beyond his expectations. Across the hall, their son's bedroom was still full of the toys and things of his that served as a constant reminder of their denial. Dr. Fraser had been right. They had to begin to let go. They had to start somewhere. What were you thinking? She roared at him, her voice full of pain and uncertainty. Did you think that I could just... that I could just... But she didn't know how to finish that sentence. I'll do whatever you want me to do, Monica. Whatever you want, he pleaded. He didn't want to fight with her. He didn't expect to see her in such pain. This had not been what he had anticipated. Whatever you want, he whispered as her sobs began to subside. I don't know, she said finally in surrender. I don't know what to do. The powerful rage was gone from her voice. Henry was glad for the respite from her anger, but what he heard now hurt him more. It was a whimper of submission. Was she finally accepting that their son was never coming home? I know, I know, he said, trying to calm her. I'll return it to Cybertronics. First thing in the morning, it's gone. He hadn't wanted to push her so far. They could find someone else for the in-home test. There was still plenty of time, plenty of qualified applicants. The prototype hadn't been imprinted so no damage was done. Monica was quiet now. The outburst had run its course, and she stood tear-stricken at the window. Okay, take him back, she said weakly. She was quiet for a time, then her voice rose in sudden indecision. I mean, Henry, did you see his face? He's so real, so real. She paused, thinking. But I mean, he's not. Inside, he's like all the rest, isn't he? She said. Yeah, a hundred miles of fiber, Henry said with a laugh. Was something happening here? What was she doing? Monica moved to the bed and sat down. She smoothed the sheets absent-mindedly and gazed out of the window at the haze that had thickened into pregnant clouds. It had felt good to let the tears flow after so long repressing them. When was the last time she'd had a good cry? The last time she'd allowed this feeling of vulnerability to open inside her? Her mind wandered as she calmed. It was a robot after all, right? A toy, really. But outside, he just looks so real, she said, almost to herself. What had happened? It had only been a matter of minutes since this boy had been brought into their home. He had only said a few little words, meaningless words, and yet it had changed everything. Was the fabric of this safe little unchanging world she constructed so easily crumbled? Where had these feelings, unbidden for so long, been hiding? Just beneath the surface all this time? Who had she been kidding? Herself. She was silent for some time as Henry waited. He hoped. Outside the raindrops fell quickly and then stopped as the sudden shower dispersed. I could use a child, she said after minutes. A mecha child, Henry said. 
He meant a child that would never grow old, that would never need to be fed or punished, that would do exactly what he was told when he was told, and would never interfere with the neat little life they had developed since Martin had left them. But most of all, he meant a child that could easily be returned if things did not work out as desired. Monica heard him make this distinction, but it didn't mean anything to her. Something in her chest had moved ever so slightly. A child, she repeated softly. From the quiet living room, David heard the woman yelling upstairs. He remembered the sound, and then decided to listen to the clicking of his shoes against the floor as he walked across the room. The floor texture changed, and his feet made sharper sounds. David decided to walk some more. He did so until he came to the window again. There he watched the gray clouds overhead move slowly against the darkening sky. He watched for some time, although he wouldn't know how long. Soon the window became wet. Drops of water fell from above. They struck and stuck to the outside surface of the window. David watched the water streak and run down the length of the glass until it gathered at the base of the pane and overflowed. In time, the droplets stopped falling, and David watched the clouds pass by. He remembered this and then walked across the floor again. He saw the couch and the chairs and remembered them. In the center of the room was a table. There was another, larger table at the far end of the room. The color of the furniture was dark. It was the color of dark polished wood. The floor was the color of dark wood and the carpet was green. David remembered all these things. In time he would understand them. The yelling had stopped. David listened but heard nothing. So he walked to the table in the center of the room. On the table he saw photos David knew photos from before, and he decided to look at them. These photos were new to David. Once he remembered something, he never forgot that thing, and he had not seen these photos before. In one of the photos, he saw the man, Henry, and the woman, whose name he had not learned yet. But there was a face in the photos that David had not seen before. It was of a person smaller than Henry and the woman. It was a boy. He remembered this new face and looked at the other photos. They were all of Henry and the woman and the boy. They wore different clothing in each photo. They smiled and looked happy. The last photo on the table was bigger than the others. Only the boy was in this photo. But David saw another face in the glass. He quickly realized that this other face was a reflection. But it also looked as if the face was in the photo beside the boy. David saw himself in the reflection. He remembered this. In time, he would know what it meant. He did not perceive them, but as David digested the family images, Monica and Henry were watching him from the spiraling staircase that led down the center of their house. They had been watching him quietly for some time. He had not acknowledged the little sounds they'd made as they came down the stairs when the sudden cloudburst had subsided. They had watched as he stared from the living room window at the receding storm, and then as he walked cautiously across the room scanning each piece of furniture with his odd, wide-eyed gaze. What was he thinking? Monica wanted to know. Was he thinking at all? Finally, David stopped before the family photos. The Mecca stayed there for a while, and when he came to the photo of Martin, 
he seemed to lean closer. The mecha boy stared at that photo for longer than he had the others. Monica felt something warm inside of her when she noticed this. It was a good feeling, a welcomed feeling. David, I have someone I want you to meet, the man Henry said. He seemed excited. Behind Henry, the woman who had yelled and run away from him before was standing with her hand over her mouth. Her face looked nervous. David did smile and said, Okay, Henry. Henry put his arm around the woman's shoulders. David, he said, this is Monica. The woman Monica looked nervous, but not exactly nervous. She looked nervous, but different. David did big smile, showing his teeth, and said, Hello, Monica. It's good to meet you. He extended his hand to do shake, but the woman drew her arms around herself and could not shake. Was she cold? She smiled, but her eyes were wet. It looked to David like tears. Was she sad and cold? Hello, David. It's, it's good to meet you, too, the woman Monica said. David remembered her voice as he had remembered Henry's earlier. He kept his hand extended for her to do shake, but she did not. Henry made a noise with his throat. <clears throat> David, Monica and I would like for you to stay here with us for a while. That way we can get to know each other a bit. Does that sound okay? Okay, Henry, David replied. He did big smile for Monica again and said, That sounds great. Quickly, Monica reached out to grasp David's hand and did shake. It was very fast. It was not like the shake that Henry had done before. Monica's hand was warm and soft. After she had done shake, Monica's face relaxed, and she looked calm. Henry looked at her, and David saw that he looked happy, like he did in the photos. Henry said, David, I want you to wait here, and we'll come and get you in a short time, okay? Okay, Henry, David replied. They had retreated back upstairs to their bedroom and left the prototype downstairs, taking in the house. Henry knew this was an important part of the acclimation process. David had to sample, or remember, everything in its environment. Although the thing had been programmed to simulate a child's behavior, he had no worries about the little mecha breaking anything. He touched nothing, unless specifically requested to do so. And unlike a real child, he could sit and wait for hours, days if need be. All things considered, the meeting had gone well enough. David had met Monica and sampled her voice and expressions for later reference. More importantly, she had spoken to David and shook his hand, even if it was a somewhat frantic gesture. The boy butt was designed to bring out maternal instincts. From the wide baby blue eyes and the light voice frequencies to the olfactory simulators in the boy bot's hair and skin, David was more real than any mecha before him. It was a little disconcerting at first meeting. Even Henry had been a bit disturbed by this when he'd first picked up the machine at the Cybertronics lab. But that had passed. He hoped Monica's reaction would pass also. The robot would have no memories of Cybertronics or its creators. Henry had been there when the battery had been set in its chest and they'd powered it up. Then the cavity had been sealed. Although the thing had been pre-programmed, it had never spoken a word until the body had been turned on and the brain inserted. Henry had heard those first words. He had been introduced to David and surprised how realistic it felt when he took the robot's small hand in his own. 
They'd exchanged greetings, and the prototype had been told to go with him. David was like no Mecca before him. Every effort had been made to make him look as realistic as possible. In spite of the miles of fibers and light metal joints inside him, David weighed only 60 pounds. Gone were the opening facial cavities and clunky metal frames that had typified the design of the old butlers and maids. David's body had no false openings for technicians to access. If he were ever damaged, they would have to go inside, just like they do with an orga child, by surgery. Every aspect of the boy was completely duplicated from orga, even those functions he would never need. He had a throat, although he'd never be able to eat. He'd never have to use the toilet, nor would he ever participate in that purely biological aspect of love. But the glands necessary for these functions were also part of his anatomy. Not only was his design unique, an almost perfect simulation of orga structure, undetectable by those not familiar with mecha subtleties, but he had another very special quality. The director had explained that David was a very special and very secret project because they believed they had manufactured a robot who could feel love. Real love. Henry had not known how to take that when he'd heard it. He didn't work in the technical departments of Cybertronics. Much of their work was kept secret until it was publicly released. But he knew that this might be the thing that Monica needed. And if she needed it, then he needed it. He had signed numerous documents, agreeing to secrecy, limitations of company liability, and to arbitration if something should go wrong. There were technical documents that he had to understand before he could leave with the Mecca. It had taken him all morning, but finally he had been flown back to New Jersey with a new gift for his wife. Henry was overjoyed that Monica was now willing to give the Mecca a chance. He waited until she was seated and drew a dramatic breath. In his hand, he held a red folder that he had been given by the director. This was an extraordinary gesture, and Henry had to impress on Monica the importance of this test. The show of faith my company has placed on me, on us, is extraordinary, he said. Now, there are a few simple but crucial procedures we need to follow if and when you decide to keep David. He handed Monica the red folder. She read the warning label. Caution. This process is irreversible and permanent. Do not initiate imprinting if you have any doubts about your feelings. If Henry was trying to make her feel uncomfortable, he was succeeding. He continued, reading from a form he held in hand. In the red folder is an imprinting protocol consisting of a code string of seven particular words that need to be spoken to David in the pre-divined order that is printed inside. He stopped reading and looked her in the eyes. Monica, he said. For our own protection, this imprinting cannot be reversed. The robot child's love would be sealed, in a sense hardwired, and we'd be part of him, forever. Because of this, after imprinting on a parent, no mecha child can be resold. Monica looked at him, uncomprehending. Henry explained. Honey, if you imprint, and then we should decide not to keep David... He must be returned to Cybertronics, for destruction. She nodded slowly, understanding now. He passed her a handful of forms before he continued. Now, I had to sign these letters of agreement before they'd even let you see David. You have to sign them too. Read them carefully, Monica. She scanned the papers. It seemed so overwhelming, all this data, all this responsibility. Was she really ready for this? Henry saw her indecision and leaned close to her, letting her know he understood. Honey, this can be a good thing for us. I know it can. And I know you sense that too. But don't imprint unless you're absolutely sure, he said. Monica sighed and shook her head. Silly man, she said. 
Of course I'm not sure. They'd given the robot the pajamas that Cybertronics had supplied. They'd also supplied a couple of changes of clothing. There really wasn't anything else they'd need. Martin's room had been prepared for their little guest. His night-lit sleeping canopy hadn't been used in five years, and Monica felt another tug of reluctance at letting the Mecca sleep there. But she wasn't going to put the poor thing on the couch, and she definitely would not let it sleep with them. The Mecca stood before the bed now, holding the plaid pajamas out in front of him. Its posture was slightly robotic, and it was staring at the ornaments hanging over the bed. The Mecca stayed in that position for some time, and Monica wondered what was going on inside its little head. The light flickering against the shiny thing that dangled over the bed made David stare. He watched it until he perceived the pattern of its movement and understood it. It was a decoration. It was in the shape of a woman, and in its center was a heart shape. In it, he saw reflections like he had in the photo. He saw himself first. Then, as the thing rotated on the string, he saw the woman, Monica, in the reflection. He turned to look at her. Her eyes were no longer wet. She was calm now. She had given him the clothing for sleeping, and he held them up to her. Would you like me to sleep now? he said. Monica didn't know what to say. She looked at Henry for guidance. Uh, sounds good, Henry offered. Sound like a good idea to you, Monica, he said. Monica shrugged. She stumbled, trying to use motherly logic. Well, it is late, you know. I mean, it's after nine. Um, how late do they let you stay up? David did not understand they. He processed her question, though, and a response came to him suddenly. I can never go to sleep, but I can lay quietly and not make a peep. Henry recognized the phrase as one of the hundreds of lines his department had sifted through for use in promotional materials. He hadn't known they'd be using it in programming. He winked at Monica, but she did not seem amused by the rhyme. She started heading for the door. Well, she said, you've got everything you need, and I guess we'll be in to check on you in the mo- She stopped when David suddenly approached her, the pajamas held out as if an offering. Dress me, David suggested as he approached Monica. She stepped away as if frightened by the robot's advance. Henry knew that this was supposed to have evoked a matronly response, but his wife was apparently not ready for it. Monica almost ran from the room. I'm going to say good night now. You boys be boys, she said, and quickly closed the door behind her. David followed her and stood there, pajamas pressed against the frosted glass surface of the door after it was closed. Henry sighed and put his hand on David's shoulder to turn the Mecca around. Arms up, he said, and the boy bot obeyed. Henry slipped the robot out of the jumpsuit and into the pajamas. She'd be okay, he thought. This was maybe just a little too much, so quickly. Monica stood in the darkness of the hallway as she caught her breath. This was happening so fast, too fast. She breathed deeply to calm herself. It was a robot. She had to remember that. Just a robot. Not a real little boy. Not like her Martin. It could never replace her son. From the shadows of the hallway, Monica peeked around the corner and watched through the door pane the blurred images of Henry and the Mecca. She listened as Henry talked to the thing while he dressed it for the night, and then she swore she saw it peering out the blurred glass in her direction. She moved away from the door, back into the darkness. Had it been looking for her?
Monica was sitting on the floor of the hallway. She was in turmoil. Perhaps she had overreacted. She looked around the corner behind her. Not a sound, not a movement. She was beginning to feel guilty. It had all begun that morning. She had woken to find Henry dressed and heading out the door. Have fun, he'd said, with a peculiar smile. Monica had been confused. Then she saw David standing at the foot of the staircase, looking all too real in his disheveled hair and bed-wrinkled pajamas. She nodded at Henry, and he'd kissed her. If you have any problems, call me, he'd said. Then he'd whispered in her ear. David was made to simulate a little boy, honey. Don't be afraid of him. I love you. Then he was gone. The inner door slid closed behind him, leaving her alone with the Mecca. Good morning, Monica, David said, smiling flatly at her. Hi, David, she replied. She smiled back and gazed awkwardly at the robot for a minute. But she could think of nothing to say. It was time for coffee. As she made her way into the kitchen, she noticed the way the little Mecca's eyes followed her, then its head. She looked away as it turned its body in her direction. Then she heard the pit-pat of its feet on the kitchen floor behind her as she prepared for breakfast. Once a casual treat, real coffee was now a luxury. Fortunately, their income provided Monica access to these simple pleasures, and she'd become a collector of interesting blends. She began the ritualistic process of measuring the grounds and pouring the coffee. She didn't use any prescribed measurements. She did it all based on the results of repeated trials and errors at different combinations. David was crouching beside her now, his eyes peeking over the counter's edge as Monica spooned her special mixture of grounds into the filter. His silly smile was gone. He watched her every move with childish fascination as she measured and poured and stirred. At first, Monica was amused by this. At least she didn't feel like running away from it again. But the humor shortly wore thin. She was just making coffee. What was so amazing about that? When her brew was finished, she sat at the table to sort through the headlines of the daily news feed. When the Mecca didn't follow, she turned to see him staring at the coffee maker. Made to simulate a boy, eh? A not-too-bright boy, perhaps. Monica went back to her paper. Suddenly, David was at her side again. Shocked, she pulled away, but quickly realized that the Mecca was gazing at her steaming cup of coffee with its two wide, two blue eyes. That again. She huffed and read some more, but when she went to sip her brew, David's eyes followed the cup up from the table to her mouth and then back down to the table. Monica watched this for a moment, and then decided that she'd had enough. She turned her back on David, but she could feel the little unblinking eyes on her back as she read. This was not going to work. Maybe it was time to do some chores. Her routine had been her mainstay, her grip on the world, for many months now. She had always been an orderly person, but with situations the way they were. It was crucial to have a regular schedule of activity. Just outside of that pattern, the awful press of desperation loomed. Only a clear sense of purpose kept it at bay. David was now interfering with that activity. Maybe it was just the way he was suddenly there beside her as she made the bed or folded linen. Maybe it was the way he had scared her when she'd rounded the corner with an armful of sheets or the way he'd followed her every move with that never-ending stare and his flat, curious expressions that seemed to only alternate between a silly closed mouth smile or utter amazement. Henry assured her that this was just the acclimating process, that David was brand new, and even with all of his programming, he still had to get used to new things and places. Monica thought they'd overdone the childish wonderment. Not everything deserved the astonished scrutiny David seemed to give it. Things had come to a head when he, when it, had stepped in her way as she brought some things up from the pool. 
She'd been headed for the washroom when in the hallway David had suddenly stopped in her path, his face displaying a new expression, the annoying simile of a boy's mischievous grin. She had stepped aside, but the robot had moved with her. She'd stepped back to go around David, but he was in her path again. Enough. Monica had had it. Come here, David, she hissed through clenched teeth. She'd led the obedient Mecca to the nearest closet and placed him inside. Finally, she could get some work done without distraction. That had been an hour ago, and the Mecca had not made a sound since. It should have been an easy hour compared to the distractions of the morning. Well, the robot was finally out of her way, wasn't it? That was what she had wanted, hadn't she? How long would it stay in the closet? Would it really just stand there until she came and got it? What if she left it there all day? All week? She shuddered as a wave of self-recrimination arose. It was just a robot, right? Ah, what am I doing, she said to herself. David saw the silhouette against the frosted glass door of the little dark room where Monica had put him. He did not know how long he had stayed there. He did not understand duration. Finally the door opened, and he saw that it was Monica again. This process seemed familiar to David. He remembered something like this from before. When she opened the door, David was standing exactly where she'd left him. He smiled up at her. Is it a game? he said. Ah, uh, yes, it's a game, Monica replied, feeling a little guilty. How could she place this little innocent thing? It's a robot in the closet. It's, um, hide-and-seek, she explained, and tapped David playfully on the shoulder. It felt so real. I found you, she said, and led him out of the closet. She guided the mecca to Martin's room and pointed inside. This is your room now. Just go play she said. David knew play. He walked into the room and found toys on the bed and floor. He took the small things into his hands and began to play. He had no real understanding of the toys and their meaning. He was not in the process of learning or dealing with emotional stresses as human children would be. It was an automated series of gestures he enacted now, picking up the toy copter and zooming it through the air. There was no fantasy of flight attached to the motion. He looked and saw that Monica was watching him, and he smiled. She smiled back and then left. Was she still playing? David wondered. Finally, Monica had some time to herself. The boy was in the bedroom, and he'd stay there playing until she told him to stop. That was at least one advantage of Mecca. She was absorbed in a book in her favorite reading room when she heard the door snick open. David stood there, smiling at her. His unblinking eyes hinted at some glee. He'd learned a new game. Found you, he said. Monica yelped and dropped her book. She lifted her sweatpants from around her ankles to cover herself. You would have assumed they'd programmed this thing to know what a toilet was. Get out of here, Monica yelled. The Mecca obeyed, walking quickly away. And close the goddamn door, Monica commanded. David obediently returned to close the door. Monica had done anger. Somehow this did not seem like an appropriate response to the game. As he walked back to his room, David's mind made the necessary associations between toilet and anger. Monica heard his footsteps against the floor as he walked away. What had she been so upset about? He was just a robot, right? Just a robot. There was no chatter at the table that evening, but this was not unusual. There hadn't been for some time. Henry had thought that David might change that. He'd have to be patient, he guessed. It couldn't happen overnight. He wondered what had happened while he was at work. Monica really hadn't said anything about her first day alone with the Mecca. She seemed annoyed about something, and Henry didn't want to press the issue. 
even if it hadn't been imprinted yet. He really didn't want to return the thing without giving it a fair chance. Monica ate her food quietly. She knew Henry was anxious about the robot. He'd be wondering if she liked it and if she were going to keep it. The truth was she didn't really know. David was cute enough. It did look real, and in spite of its annoying little habits of appearing from around corners and blocking her path, not to mention walking in on her in the bathroom, she'd have to break him of that one. David wasn't really that bad. She looked over at the robot. She had set a place at the table for it, thinking that maybe it would help it get through this acclimation process. And now she saw that David was copying their movements. David watched Monica and Henry. They were putting things into their mouth. This was eating. David did not understand eating, but he knew he wasn't supposed to. He didn't know why he knew this. He observed and remembered the way they moved their arms as they used the tools to eat with. He decided to learn this, too. Henry noticed when David began to mimic him. Had it been doing that all day? No wonder Monica seemed so annoyed. He had explained to her that David would have to acclimate to the house, but maybe she wasn't acclimating to it. As Henry drank, David picked up the empty glass and put it to its mouth. The glass was so big against its face that the Mecca had to cross its eyes to continue watching Henry's movements. Henry looked at his wife and saw her watching the robot, too. Monica rolled her eyes at David's new game and went back to her meal again. She rolled some spaghetti on her fork and was lifting it to her mouth when she noticed that David was mimicking her. She stopped eating. David stopped moving as well and fixed her with an expectant gaze. Monica knew that it would stay in this position as long as she did, so she put the food into her mouth and ignored it. As she chewed, strands of spaghetti hung from her mouth and dangled over her chin. David knew eating. He also knew that Monica was eating wrong. Something was hanging from her mouth. Monica was eating incorrectly. Was this a funny thing? David knew funny and made the appropriate response. <laughs> Henry and Monica both jumped at the sudden staccato sound that erupted from David. He was pointing at Monica, his face drawn long in laughter. It was a sound that they had not heard in a long, long time. It was odd, like a cartoon, but it was a welcome variation on the theme, and soon Monica and Henry were laughing with him. She pulled a little piece of spaghetti from the side of her mouth and dangled it before David. Was this what it found so funny? The boy bot's face was actually turning red in its fit, just like a real boy's face, and Henry laughed again at this. David heard Henry and turned to face him, going into another bout of the strange, hocketing sounds. Monica tried to explain through her fit how much David had shocked her, but she couldn't get the words out of her mouth. The couple gazed at each other. Months, maybe years of tension had left them, ushered away by the unpredictable action of this little robot. David observed Monica and Henry laugh. The funny was over now. Laughter was no longer necessary. So he stopped as suddenly as he'd begun. Henry and Monica's fits subsided as they saw David looking at them curiously. He glanced to and fro between them, his unblinking eyes turning first, and then his head following, in one of the few gestures that gave away his mecha nature. Monica had figured that it was all a controlled process, that David was somehow programmed to laugh at things that seemed out of place. But that didn't matter. The sound had been real enough, and consuming. It was a wonderful sound. Henry was encouraged to have seen Monica laughing freely and fully for the first time in years. It was a good sight, a beautiful sight. He went back to his meal feeling better than he had in a long time. David remained silent throughout the rest of dinner, but in the toy's presence was something new and warm, and Henry caught Monica watching it once or twice as they ate. What had that been in her eyes? 
Affection? Was something happening here? Monica couldn't put off dealing with David forever. Henry had told her she had to make a decision, sooner or later, and she couldn't make a decision if she didn't try to get to know the Mecca. She had laughed at that idea at first, getting to know a robot. But after the dinner experience, so similar to the way things had been before, Monica decided she was going to give it a try. She decided to dress David alone that night. A couple of times, as she'd lifted his arms to change his shirt, and as he'd balanced on one leg as she slipped him out of his pants, the Mecca had reached out as if to hug her. She had pulled away from those awkward embraces. She knew that it was only a program, but she wasn't ready for that, if she ever would be. Somewhere she still had another obligation. She slipped the plaid pajama over the little boy bot's head. Martin would have needed a bath, but David was as clean and fresh as when he first walked into their home. Monica winced at how terribly real he seemed from even this close. His skin was eerily lifelike. They'd even given him the smell of a freshly bathed child. Maybe, as David got more accustomed to life here, he could play outside like other boys and get dirty. She imagined scolding him some day, fussing over the mess he'd made of himself like Martin had made her do so many times. But that was stupid, wasn't it? David wasn't like other boys. He was a mecha, a robot, an imitation. She'd never scold him, nor feel pride at his good grades. She'd never sit up at night worried about where he was or whom he was with, nor would she ever meet that someone special he brought home before he said goodbye. Monica looked up into David's eyes. She gazed into his eternal stare. Was there something there? Could she really learn to love something that wasn't really there? Time for bed, she whispered, as if talking to a real child. Okay, Monica, David replied with flat enthusiasm. She led him to the bed canopy and turned off the room lights. The canopy detected the change and the night lights came on automatically, bathing the room in a wash of blue. David crawled up into the bed and sat. How many times had she read to Martin in this bed? How many times had her little boy, her dear little lost boy, waited expectantly for her to lay beside him with the storybooks he loved so? She suppressed a tear and crawled up beside David. He stared into the darkness of the room with his vacant smile and unceasing gaze. Couldn't they have programmed him to blink or something? At least he should close his eyes while he feigned sleep. Monica buttoned the boy's shirt and held the covers up. He looked into the open blankets and then slipped slowly under them. His movements were precise and mechanical. Monica wondered if that would change after she imprinted. Would his movements become real? Could he really become the same as... She stopped herself. What was she thinking about? She didn't even know if she was going to imprint. She hadn't had enough time to make a decision like that. She tucked the boy under the covers, and he laid back, staring up into the blue lights of the canopy. It seemed as if he was watching the little metal mobile that hung at the mouth of the bed. But was he watching anything at all? Could he really see these things? Could he understand what was really happening around him, or was it all just a flood of numbered data streaming into his mechanical brain? Was he alive in there? Suddenly, unbidden and unwelcomed, Martin's frozen image came into her mind's eye. The question came to her again. Was he alive in there? She could not stop the tears this time. Would she ever see her real little boy again, hear his laughter, and feel his small arms around her. My baby, she said, her voice thick with tears. 
David could not do sleep, so he laid still and ignored Data. He would stay that way until someone addressed him directly or some unexpected stimuli caused a necessary response. Monica was leaning over him. Her face was strained like she was in pain. She made the crying sound. My baby is what she said. David did not know this phrase. Was she addressing him? He did not think so. He did not react. Caution. Please remember that this program, once activated, is permanent, indelible, and unalterable. The words forbade any further passage, and yet Monica found herself opening the envelope. The seal broke easier than one would have surmised based on the words it bore. What now was this that she had planned? Monica wasn't quite sure she was really doing this. Henry had said she had more time, that there was no rush. But how much longer would she need to make such a decision? Days? Weeks? How could she ever really decide to replace? She stopped that thought. Was that what she was doing? She put those questions aside, pulled the slip of instructions from the folder, and focused on the words before her. They were simple instructions. Was it really that easy to enact this permanent and indelible program? Imprinting protocol. Quick startup instructions. Dear God, she thought. Quick start. What was this? A shortcut to love? A portrait of the mecca's head was featured, and circular marks outlined specific places on its forehead and on the back of its neck. These were activation zones. She was to touch these zones in sequence. Monica read on. Step one. Repeat the following words slowly and clearly in precise order. Monica read the words she was supposed to repeat. She wondered how they came up with these things. Step two. State your name and then state the name of your mecca. Was she really going to do this? Step three. Restate your name clearly and release the pressure from the activation zone. That was all? What then? What was David going to do then? Did they not have enough foresight to... And that was when she realized that she was actually going to go through with it. She looked over at David, who had been sitting by the bay windows, awaiting instructions. The bright sunlight that burned through the window was diffused by cloud cover, and the room was awash in a golden light. It was surreal. David was bathed in this light, and Monica felt a twinge at the sight. He was beautiful, wasn't he? In his own way, he was a beautiful thing. Her heart raced a little. Here we go, she thought. Monica knelt before David and studied the instructions again. The Mecca's eyes registered no expectations, no fear or apprehension about what she was going to do. Just that vacant smile and unceasing gaze. She reread the words and studied the activation zones. Is it a game? David said as she read. But Monica didn't register the question. She may not have had an answer anyway. Now, David, I want you to hold still for me, okay? She said, as if it was necessary to ask. Yes, Monica, he replied. Such an eternally obedient child, she thought. Would that change? Who would he be after this? She pressed the palm of her hand against the first activation zone in the center of his forehead. Can you feel that? she said. Yes, Monica, he replied. She let ten seconds or more pass and then removed her hand. She studied the sheet again. Now, I'm going to read some words, and they won't make any sense, but I want you to listen to them anyway and look at me all the time. Can you do that, David? Yes, Monica. His face was expressionless. She waited for a moment. The first activation zone was not a trigger. 
The initial sequence it activated would override in 45 seconds if she did not continue. But the second zone... She put her hand behind the mecha's neck and felt the incredible simulation of a spinal cord. She pressed her fingers against it and felt the bones give a little. No turning back now. Can you feel my hand on the back of your neck? She said. Yes. Does any of this hurt? No. Okay, she said nervously. Look at me. She caught David's eyes, and the boy stared blankly back at her. Ready? she said. David had seen something new when Monica had touched him on the head. It was something he had not seen before. The light in the room had taken on a new sheen. David had no words for these things, and they were unimportant to him anyway. All that mattered now was what Monica was instructing him to do. She wanted him to pay attention to what she was going to read to him. She reached up and put her hand behind his head. The light in the room changed again. It was more than just colors, something more that he could not comprehend. But this again was unimportant, because now he must respond to Monica's question. David did not understand hurt. He knew what hurt looked like and the responses that were necessary. But her question was beyond him. He told her, no. Then she said, look at me. Ready? And she began to read. Cirrus. The word meant nothing to David. The sound, though, seemed to make him want to respond. But he did not have an appropriate response, so he did smile and watched Monica's face as instructed. Socrates. Another new word. No meaning. Some suggestion. Something new, like the water that had fallen on the window, slowly at first. Particle. And then bigger drops, quickly building in numbers and size until they had obscured the vision to the outside world. Decibel. And everything had become unfocused, filtered through the wet surface of the glass. Hurricane and there was only the water shifting against the gray. Dolphin. And the reflection in the glass. His reflection. Tulip. But something else was there now. Another face. Monica. That was bigger now. The light around her was all wrong. So much light. David. Too bright. Too many colors. And Monica. Mommy. David's face remained unchanged while she read. Had she seen some movement behind those unblinking eyes, she wasn't sure. As she completed the protocol and removed her hand from the activation zone, his face finally changed. His mouth dropped from the vacant smile into a slack-jawed stare. His eyes became ponderous. He looked puzzled. What was he seeing? David? she said cautiously. David did not respond. He continued to stare at her as if he'd never seen her before. Had she made a mistake? She reviewed the words quickly. No, she had pronounced the words correctly and spoken them in the right order. So what was going on? Oh, why hadn't they put some information on what to expect? It would have been easy enough to just... What were those words for, Mommy? Monica looked up at David. What had he just said? In his face was something new, and what was that in his eyes? Above his eyes, his brows were drawn into a question. Some lonely place in her heart opened, and a darkness too long kept there was dismissed in that instant. A feeling that she'd not known for years welled up beneath her doubt and anxiety and threatened to burst her heart. What did you call me? she said through a thick throat. Mommy. He whispered the word in tender reverence, and the smile on his lips was new and spoke of impossible emotions. She had to hear it again. How long had it been? Oh, David, who am I? She said, knowing the response, needing the wonderfully alive feeling that word would bring to her, desperate for the healing the sound of that simple word would catalyze. 
David was suddenly moving upon her, engulfing her in his little boy embrace. Shocked, she dropped the instructions and moved as to retreat. But his small form was already folded against her, his small arms clinging to her. These are impossible feelings to escape, these drives of motherhood. She had fought feeling this way about David ever since she'd met him, but yet here she was, caught finally in his simple childish trap. She could not curse the creators of this being for their genius, though. Her heart was filled with a primal joy. She embraced David and rocked him gently in her lap, ran her fingers through his soft hair, feeling his tender face against her shoulder. You are my mommy, David said. For some time, holding each other as the golden glow waned outside, duration made no sense to either of them. 